record to the cloud. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, I hope you're doing okay. I'm my name is Alper. I'm the education content manager for this year's Code Day Labs. You've probably seen me or heard me before. My camera isn't working today, so yeah. Um, I'm happy to welcome Sam today, uh, and he will be talking to you guys about developing audiovisual augmented reality experiences with Project North Star. Sam, if you'd like to give a little more of a background about yourself and then get started with your presentation, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. So. Um... I'm a PhD student, second year PhD student, um, exploring computational art and multi-sensory augmented reality technologies. Um, yeah, and I've got a little presentation here to give to you guys. Uh, and we're gonna follow with a, a demo and then a Q and A section if you guys have questions. So thank you all for coming. Um, so as I said, my uh, work draws on uh, my experience in sonic interaction design and musical instrument design. So yeah, I'll start my presentation now. Um, so in my undergraduate degree at Sussex from 2015 to 2018, I focused mainly on instrument design. Uh, so musical instrument design, uh, hardware, software, installations, hacking, um, anything really. Um, some of my projects included a self-playing xylophone uh, that you could interact with by walking around it um, or using your um, hands on either side of it. Um, then had a glove, uh, a glove with flex sensors in that you could um, expressively control audio plugins in um, music mixing um, software. Um, and also down here, a, a, a cello that uh, generatively played music um, with the help of motors and buttons that kind of prodded at the strings. Uh, so this was during my undergrad degree. Um, in my master's degree, I started focusing more on spatial audio. Uh, this was in 2018. Uh, my final project is pictured here. It was a, an eight speaker sound installation um, that had um, uh, a guitar uh, on a chair that uh, you could sort of play or, or pluck at or hit. Um, and the sound of the guitar came through the speakers um, and in front of each of the speakers, there was a motion tracker. And so the sound of the guitar coming through the speakers was dependent on the movement with within, uh, within the circle. So people could move inside the circle and affect the, the sounds in weird ways. Um, and so m melting like the kind of spatial audio stuff and my instrument design um, practice together, um, these things both really excited me and, and, and therefore I pursued a PhD in music technologies focusing on augmented reality. So that's, that's mainly what I'm going to be talking about today is augmented reality. Um, and so this is where my creative practice has led me um, towards augmented reality. So. What is augmented reality? So it's normally defined as a system uh, that does three things. So firstly, it combines real and virtual processes. Uh, secondly, it's interactive in real time. And thirdly, it's registered in three dimensions. Um, and so when we look at this definition, we see that nothing really rules out using audio or touch technologies, smell technologies, even taste technologies. Yet for like the last 20 years, AR has pretty much solely been associated with visual overlay. Uh, additionally, nothing about this, this definition and specification rules out slightly different processes, such as altering our reality through virtual means, mixing these elements, or even taking away objects that are in our real reality uh, through computational methods. However, just like the focus on the visual, AR is typified by applications and use cases that do none of those things. AR is typically seen as a system that overlays virtual objects onto our real scene. For some reason, someone somewhere has decided that the ultimate end goal for augmented reality is donning a pair of ultra cool hacker glasses and getting an overlay to the nearest McDonald's. Um, this to me sounds, um, quite boring and not where I see augmented reality going. 
um, definitely a use case, but for me, it's not like an end game or, or anything like that. So my work, sound, which is more of a fleeting medium, one that is impermanent, intangible, you can't really see or touch it. Um, it's brought to the forefront and made permanent, meaningful and tangible. For me, augmented reality is so much more than just McDonald's glasses. It's got potential to be uh, one of the most creative and expressive tools for multi-sensory art creation. To the top right, um, you can see a project that used QR codes to display separate band members. So I had a QR code that would pop up a, a guitarist or a bassist or singers or a drummer. Um, and you could view this AR through your phone and mix the volume of the different instrumentalists by moving your phone away or moving the QR codes away. Um, and then you could put effects on it through the screen, there were sliders. And this was my first kind of look into AR. And whilst it demonstrated the spatial qualities, the gestural qualities of AR to me, it really did have quite a lot of drawbacks. Uh, it was less so reality that was being augmented and more like the camera view on my phone. Um, the audio wasn't in my ears, it was coming out the speakers. Um, and it was all not so believable. Like I said, it's not, wasn't really reality that was being augmented. The gestural interactions, are you moving away or to from the, the QR codes, was quite unintuitive. It wasn't expressive. It was quite bland. And so going into my first PhD project, one of the first projects of my PhD, a uh, picture on the bottom right there is a system called Area. Um, and I decided to do completely away with the visual. I thought, what is augmented reality like when you don't have any cool overlay glasses or a headset to look through. What is it like if it's purely just audio that's being augmented? Your real audio environment, but with a virtual layer on top that is interactive in real time, registered in three dimensions. Uh, so it completely fits that typical definition of AR that we see in the industry and in academia as well. Um, and so you might be thinking, what do you use, if not a headset for AR, what's the equivalent in audio? And I found these, um, I'm actually wearing them right now because for the demo that I'm going to give later. Um, they're called bone conduction headphones. They can be found quite cheap. These ones are slightly more expensive because they're wireless. Um, and they are headphones that don't go in your ears. They go on your temple just before it gets to your ear. And what that means essentially is that before you even hear your own environment or at the same time as you hear your own environment, the vibrations from these pads that are coming from your computer or the headset or from your phone, um, the transducers on them send the mechanical sound waves into your head uh, and you can hear stuff without your ears being blocked like traditional headphones. Uh, and so for me, this kind of, I was like, wow, these are sort of like the audio version of a headset mm. with an audio, uh, with an augmented reality headset. Your vision isn't blocked. You're looking through these lenses. You can see your hand in front of you, uh, but you can also see the virtual objects in your scene. So this area project, um, used a hand tracker, as you can see um, down here, um, and a 360 degree microphone, quite a fancy microphone that is just underneath the camera that's taking this picture. Um, and it captured audio in three dimensions. So this microphone is, is, is quite uh, special. It, it records um, technically uh, an infinite sound field. It's, it's a three-dimensional sound field um, that translates pressure from directions of sound fields into a three-dimensional sound field that you can put virtual microphones into and synthesize hearing from different locations. So in this system, I had a hand tracker and you could do a, a grab gesture to start recording sound from the microphone in your environment. But 
depending on where you had your hand when you started and when you finished, it would record different parts of your room depending on where your hand was centered to the, to the mat. So if I had my hand and I grabbed out in front of the mat over the hand tracker, it would record what was in front of me. Whereas if I had grabbed closer to myself, it would record what was behind me and to the left and to the right as well. And so you captured these sounds using this, this gesture, and then you could manipulate the sound using different audio effects, using both of your hands in up and down and rotation. Um, and it was in real time. Uh, and then you could place that sound, that affected sound clip, uh, anywhere you wanted around you like that. Uh, so imagine yourself as center on that mat. If you placed it there, you would hear it ahead of you looping. If you placed it there, you'd hear it to your right looping and to your left and behind you. So you could place up to eight of these different recorded sounds around you and then listen to this virtual audio soundtrack that had been manipulated from your real audio world. Um, and to make it slightly more believable, uh, I modified these headphones to have a rotation tracker on them so that as you rotated your head whilst you were sat down, the whole scene moved, um, but kind of stayed, stayed the same. Your head in the software moved. And so in this custom software, it, it took, took care of all of the audio. And this was my first real augmented reality project, like just the first one that wasn't on a smartphone um, and kind of dealt with the issues that I found with smartphone AR. It was slightly more expensive um, because smartphones are slightly more ubiquitous these days. Um, and required a lot more work because I custom made the software. But it was a, an interesting first project into looking at what AR is if it's not just a headset. So I really learned a lot about what augmented reality means for audio and what audio means for augmented reality. Um, and after I developed this, I happened across Project Northstar, which is what I'm mainly here to talk to you about today. Um, Project Northstar is an open source augmented reality headset. All of the files, the schematics, the software is free to download and also change at your own will. The main body of the headset is 3D printable, which means that the barrier to entry is so much more accessible. Whereas a typical AR headset these days costs around anywhere from $1,500 to $3,000. This headset cost about 600 to 700 US dollars in total. And you think that this accessibility and increased security and privacy due to not having to sign any policies for using it would all mean that the specs were worse, right? Surely these, the specifications of this headset can't be as good as something Microsoft gives you, right? Um, the headset currently has the largest field of view on the market for any AR headset, meaning that you can see more virtual content um, wider. Um, it has the same screens that the Vive Index VR headset has. It has the best in class hand tracking in the form of the Ultra Leap Stereo IR170. It has an amazing six degrees of freedom movement tracker. And my favorite fact about it is that it has a Discord server with over 2000 people in who've helped, this, helped me endlessly uh, with my project. So my project with the North Star is to create multi-sensory, firstly, just starting with audio and visual, but hopefully looking at branching out into smell and taste um, and definitely touch. So multi-sensory augmented reality, musical instruments that vary in size from hand-sized instruments to room-sized in, uh, instruments and experiences. And these will be open source Unity projects and will involve expressive hand and body-based gestures. Um, it doesn't currently have an inbuilt audio solution, the headset itself, um, but in my development uh, purposes, I'm using this pair of bone conduction headphones, uh, as you can see in that photo. Um, and they kind of, they're non-intrusive and the headset itself only has two cables coming out of it. And the heads uh, and the Bluetooth headphones obviously don't have any cables. Um, yeah, so I'm going to give a brief demo. I'm not sure how it's going to work. Um, sorry if it gets a bit loud. It shouldn't do. I've done a test. 
Um, yeah, so I'm just going to transition to the demo scene. So in this demo, I've got a, a, a small cube in front of me, a blue cube. Um, and you can see in Unity, this is Unity 3D, and I'm using Project SQ, which is an open source uh, software, sort of software stack for Unity. It's implemented in Unity, and it allows you to use the headset, basically, and, and make all your scenes in Unity, which is great, because it's what a lot of people are um, used to. And I have this cube uh, that has an audio source on it. Um, it's spatially blended to 3D. Um, and yeah, it's just an audio sample that will be looping. It's the sound of some, some waves or some water. And yeah, I'm going to put the headset on now. I hope it's, um, I hope it will, uh, work. Um, I'm just going to test the sound a little bit. Um, yeah, so. This is the headset itself. I've showed it to you once before, but again, here it is. Um, it's got a camera hanging off the side of it. This is how I'm doing the demo. Um, normally doesn't have that on, so um, it looks a bit uh, hacky because it is. Didn't have much time to put that part of it together before I wanted to start developing actual experiences in Unity. So um, yeah, I'm going to hear the audio coming out of these. You'll hear it coming through the Zoom. Um, Unfortunately, it's not going to be in stereo. So as I move to the left and to the right of this cube, you won't hear it in left and right. But if you were wearing the headset, you would. Uh, and if I was using a slightly different setup than, I'm, than I am today, you would as well. Um, but yeah, hopefully that, that doesn't break the immersion. Um, so yeah, it just goes over the head like that. And then you can tighten it at the back. Um, and so in Unity, we've got our editor here um, and our inspector here. Standard Unity stuff. Here's our scene content. Our hands are here waiting for us to start the tracking. Um, and hopefully this doesn't deafen everybody. Um, I'm going to be doing some sound tests whilst I do it. So I'm going to hit play on the Unity project. And it doesn't like the hand tracking today. But I'm just going to turn up the sound a little bit so it's a bit louder. And I'm going to bring the um, through lens camera into the zoom window. So you should be able to see that cube. Um, here's the hand tracking. You can see those spooky skeleton hands um, tracked in real time. Uh, and you can do stuff like pick things up and resize them. Um, see that the, the quality is um, made worse by the camera that I'm using. It's about that big and it's uh, just in front of my eye here. Um, so through the lens experience is, is a lot high def and the frame rate is about 120 hertz. So a lot better than what we receive on Zoom, unfortunately. But um, you can hear as I bring this further away from me and closer to me, the sound of the water gets louder, hopefully. And so this is just a basic demo of um, some audio sample manipulation um, uh, in Unity, just with a basic cube. I mean, this isn't the end goal by any means for my for my audio visual experiences, um, but just a just a basic one to demonstrate the headset capabilities. Um, and you can kind of place things look somewhere else, look down and it's still there. Hand tracking is independent. You can do right hand, sorry, left hand, right hand. Um, 
And what Project ESCII, which is the, uh, the kind of stack, the renderer, um, it's allowing us to use Mixed Reality Toolkit, uh, which is Microsoft's uh, AR Mixed Reality Toolkit in Unity, and use the same kind of assets like these, um, like this pointy finger touch thing, the circle on the end of my finger, uh, and the way that that highlights on the object to show me, oh, you're very close to it now. Uh, and you can just reach out, touch it. Well, the fact that that turns blue and I can rotate the object like that. Um, but yeah, so for, for audio, this is a, is a very basic sample, just looping. Um, yeah, so this was sort of the first demo that I did. Um, just while I talk, I'm gonna Take that off so you don't get motion sickness. This is one of the first demos that I did for audio visual just last month. Um, it's just an audio source in Unity. It's not that interesting, but the spatial engine in Unity means that audio is taken care of and distance from it and also left and right uh, is what you hear in your, in your uh, ears. Uh, not through Zoom today though, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Um, I've got a second scene here um, uh, with two cubes. How imaginative of me. Um, and this is going to be using, um, I'm going to take this off for this explanation. Um, this is using something a little bit more complex. Um, it's a type of sound synthesis, uh, which is when sounds are made in real time rather than just playing a sample from the buffer in the computer, like an MP3 file or a WAV file. Uh, it's a form of synthesis, so it's generating the sound in real time, uh, called granular synthesis. And so what this does is, um, we can see in Unity here, I've got two uh, cubes, a clap cube and a bottle cube. Um, and they are pointing towards uh, two audio files. Um, the bottle cube is pointing towards the bottle stopper opener dot mp3, just a, just a sample here, just the sound of a bottle opening. Um, and the clap cube is pointing towards this clap. Um, I'm really sorry if that's very loud. Um, uh, but it shouldn't be. Okay, apparently you can't really hear it, but essentially they're just a clap and a bottle being opened. Um, and there are two um, MP3 files. And so you might be thinking, you said it was doing real-time synthesis, not playing a sample. Well, granular synthesis is when you have a sound file and you chop it into many, many different parts. And these parts loop or they play concurrently. And there are, there are different length and there are different um, position within the waveform. There are different volume, there are different pitch. And it's a, it's a great way of making synthesis out of samples. Um, so there is going to be some real time effects in this, which is great because that's exactly what I want. I don't want just, uh, just sound files playing on an object. Uh, that might be something that I want in the corner of a room. I might want a speaker playing some music, but I also want an instrument over here that I can interact with and, and make expressive gestures that um, make cool sounds, right? Um, so that's why this might be interesting, because suddenly I have all of these sliders here that I can affect in real time that change the sound of these grains. So each cube is going to be making 20 grains which will be of different length. There's a randomness function here, different length, different position in the waveform of the, the bottle stopper or the clap. Um, they're gonna have different sonic um, qualities um, and they're all gonna be playing in real time or next to each other, or that's all kind of taken care of by this, this granulator, which is an open source script found online. Um, and so if I put the headset on and play this, it should be slightly more uh, expressive. So, again, apologies if this is quite loud.
it might sound absolutely crazy. So I'm going to move away from them. Um, so you can see here I've got about um, half a meter between me and them, which is great because in the uh, software um, it's set up for uh, half a meter. <laughs> so that's a great that's a great thing that it's working properly. So the closer I get, you'll be more likely to hear it. Or them, because they're right next to each other. If I moved one away, move this one to the center. This is the clap that's been turned into a into a constantly playing clap with 20 different players. And um, one thing that's slightly interesting about it now is that it's got this thing called the Doppler effect, which is like uh, when you hear an ambulance go by, you hear it get louder and then softer as it goes away, but actually the pitch of it changes as well. So it's slightly more noticeable on the um, bottle stopper here, which sounds crazy. Um, Gonna check that the sounds all right. So we can see that these are, uh, are not not terribly imaginative objects in three D. I mean, it's cool that they're different colors. It's cool that they're different sizes. It's cool that I can move them around. I mean, maybe that's all cool enough. Um, every day when I sit down and I'm playing with two cubes, I I want something slightly more interesting. So. We can take this, uh, I think this is the bottle one. Um, we'll move that one out of the way. This is the bottle cube. Um, and we can just look in the settings. I'm just gonna move it away whilst we talk. Um, in the synthesizer, we can see that the, um, bigger the cube is, the longer the grain length. So we might be able to actually hear what that, what that grain length actually means. So, might be more, more noticeable when it's smaller. It's slightly more manic, a bit more, um, I just realized I had the randomness, randomness function on, so you'll definitely be able to hear it now. Um, Fortunately, my hand tracking stopped. So I'm going to have to stop the demo there and debug that later. Um, and I probably should have um, stopped that through lens camera. Um, but yeah, that's um, just a small demo of some of the, the kind of daily things I get up to in Unity with uh, audio visual stuff. Um, still quite basic, but. Um, yeah, I've only been about a month into it now. So, um, well, I mean, my build process took about a year. Um, deep, like debugging and troubleshooting took some of that year as well. But um, yeah, um, that's kind of what I've been up to audio visually wise. Um, a couple of cool things to mention um, is if you're interested, uh, is the Project North Star documentation website, docs.projectnorthstar.org. I don't work for Project North Star, but they're awesome. Um, and they're making AR accessible, which is an amazing thing when it normally costs like 2000 bucks. Um, loads of great pages here, how to build the headset. Um, loads of information. Um, the other thing is the Discord server that I mentioned with like 2,000 users. Um, 
loads of great pages, uh, sorry, great rooms with, I mean, this was around the time where I was trying to solve a lot of problems. So it's a lot of me uh, complaining about my problems, um, but loads of really great help um, and really, really great response times from people who know what they're doing, uh, which is great for people like me who sometimes don't know what they're doing. Um, another thing is um, my website, samvilbo.com, if you're interested in other projects that I've done. Um, other than that, um, I think I might give uh, back over and um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take Thank them. you so much, Sam, for the demos and the presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, to the attendees, if you guys have any questions at all, feel free to write it in the Q&A. Maybe you can ask about Sam's background or how we got here, whatever you want to ask. Uh, meanwhile, I can I can probably yeah, just sure. explain how, sure. how I got here. Um, um, I uh, started university thinking I wanted to be a music producer. <laughs> um, I play guitar mainly. I haven't, I haven't picked that up for a while since I got this headset though. Um, yeah, so I went to university to do music technology, hoping to, to become a, a, a music producer. And I was introduced to something called live coding um which is a type of uh i guess musical performance musical instrument um where um you code and it makes sounds uh which is amazing so uh for example um i mean i'm not going to play any of it here because i mean copyright's dodgy right so um Here's some live coding. Um, you can see they're coding the sounds in real time. Um, and you can hook up hardware to it and all sorts and visuals and audio reactive visuals. Um, and I was like, wow, what? <laughs> um, this is amazing. And people make their own instruments. Um, and I think in the course of about one lecture, I decided that that was what I was interested in. and six years, seven years later, um, it's what I'm doing. Um, uh, I've just kind of followed through in university, um, just doing projects, just engaging with communities online of people doing similar things. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, kind of how and why, I guess, I, I'm doing what I'm doing. Oh, great. We are Thank you for answering that. We have two questions in the Q&A. Um, oh, yeah. Did you learn programming while in college to program all that cool stuff? Uh, so, um, yeah, so, so a, lot of the a lot of the time these days, I, I sit at the computer and I, I, I look at these problems that I'm having in Unity or in scripts or in um, like trying to make the buttons on the headset do things that I want them to do. I think I wish I did a CS degree. <laughs> I wish I did a CS degree because I'd, I'd, I'd know a little bit more about the background of what these things are and how they work. And that would help me. Um, but I didn't do a CS degree. I did a music technology degree. And so I know a lot more about sound synthesis and the history of, and the practice of electronic music and, and, and why it matters and why it's cool. Um, and, and through that found uh, creative users of technology um, and just kind of brute forced my way into learning and trying to understand. So I learned a very minimal amount of programming at a university or, or college. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what college is because I'm in the UK, but if we're talking like between the ages of 16 and 18, I didn't know any code between 18 and I'm, I'm 24 now. So between 18 and 24, I learned the majority of my stuff off the internet, to be honest, and just kind of poking through unity, poking through these live coding languages, reading the docs, always read the docs, um, documentation. Um, yeah. And going, going to my, um, teachers, uh, at college and so at university, like between 18 and, and, and 21 and saying these are the problems that I'm having 
this is what I want it to sound like, or this is what I want it to feel like, or uh, and and seeing if they had any answers. And most of the time they did, because I had amazing tutors. Um, but a lot of the help I found online, um, yeah. Great, so, thank yeah, you. Specifically in the Discord channel as well uh, for this headset, a lot of help. Um, YouTube, a lot of help. Um, Reddit, a lot of help sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, our next one is, how are you able to make the parts for the headset mechanism? Okay, um, so I'm gonna um, switch over to my web view uh, and bring up the headset. I'm just gonna unplug it though. So the fan's on. So yeah, the headset's made of like three distinct parts. Um, the optics bracket, which is like this main chunky part along the front, uh, the lid, everything inside it as well, and this main uh, like headgear assembly part. Um, the question was, how was I able to make the parts? Um, so on the website here, there's 3D printing variants. Um, you click on it and there are, for all these different sections that I, I mentioned, um, there's all of the different 3D printed part types on GitHub. You download them. If you have access to a 3D printer, you put them through your 3D slicer and then you print them out. So I've got a 3D printer just over there. I'm very lucky to have one uh, in my uh, room, although sometimes it's very noisy. Um, but yeah, so so it's mainly all 3D printed. Um, but I can see that your, your questions, especially the lenses. So yeah, this single piece combiner is really special. Um, there were efforts to 3D print it out of a special material and like sand it down until it was see-through, but I don't think they got that far. I mean, it, they got to the point where you could cut, it was tr translucent, but um, actually transparent, no. So um, it's actually through this company called Smart Prototyping. Um, uh, this is the headset. Um, and I bought all of the electronics and the um, combiner, the lens, uh, through this. So these guys are great. Um, they have a presence on the Discord server if you've got any more questions. Unfortunately, um, the headset's not currently able to be bought um, because of this display driver board. Um, because of the chip shortage, um, it's, uh, it's not actually being able to be made, but they're working on a second version with a slightly lower refresh rate, but it means that people can buy it again. So that would be great. Um, and the display is, I'm not 100% sure, but I can find out very quickly whether or not it's glass or plastic. Um, optical combiner. Um, I believe that it is polycarbonate. Yeah, so it's polycarbonate. I don't know if that's plastic. It's definitely not glass. Um, if it was glass, I'd be a lot more scared to like pick this thing up and move it around. Um, but luckily these are fairly replaceable. And um, yeah, I was saying um, to Alpha earlier that um, I, the other day was giving my PhD supervisors a demo and I picked it up and I picked it up really badly on like one of these, one of these handles and the hinge snapped and I was like, wow, that's going to be really annoying if that happens during like a, a user test or a user study that I'm planning on doing in a couple months. So I decided to print out some extra parts just in case that happened. And this afternoon, um, so I built this thing about a year ago, so it is, it is getting a bit like old. I don't have a temperature suitable room for it, I don't think. It kind of sits next to my PC. Um, 
I don't know where I'm going with this. Yeah, so the great thing about the fact that it's 3D printable is that you can replace parts. Um, if you have access to a 3D printer, and it actually happened about three hours ago where I did um, a similar thing, and I, I'd actually realized that a couple of things had snapped along here. Maybe I'm not using the best printer settings, um, but I thought they'd be all right for today, but just in case I printed an extra couple of hinges, and um, it was actually a different part, but um, I managed to replace it just before five o'clock today. So luckily the demo still went ahead. Yeah, so I hope that answers your question about uh, how it's made. Um, if you don't have access to a 3D printer, um, when smart prototyping comes back up um, and they have the display driver board, you there's actually a version that you can buy that has the printed parts uh, ready printed. Um, it just costs a bit more because of shipping. They're in uh, Shenzhen in China. So yeah, it's the only thing I would say. If you can, if you have access to like a local hacker space with a 3D printer, I definitely recommend printing it yourself. You can choose the color yourself, all sorts. There's like bright blue um, headsets uh, that people have made. Um, all sorts. Uh, there's actually uh, someone made like a Star Wars Rebel Alliance helmet. Um, yeah. So 3D printing is great and it means that this is so much more um, accessible. And so, yeah, I, I've, your second question was, are there LEDs inside the polycarb uh, polycarbonate or is it light projected onto it? it? Might be might be slightly difficult for me to show you this, but the um, this is the combiner and there's a screen there and a screen there and they project outwards onto the combiner and as you're looking through it, you see your real world and also you see the reflection of the screens by your side here of the content. Um, and that's all taken care of by Project Esky, as I said, um, um, is the Unity implementation that I'm working with. Uh, it's here on GitHub. Um, uh, Damien, this guy, amazing, who works really hard on this. Um, this takes care of all of the um, projection onto the combiners. Um, yeah, hope that answers your questions. Thank you, Sam. Um, so they asked if the glass plastic is a dis display and are there LEDs inside the polycarbonate? So I think you should show like the part where the displays are separate. Yeah, yeah. So from the side here, you can see that the um, the, uh, the, the um, actual combiner lens here is completely separate from the display. The display sends out light uh, and, and they get combined when you look through them. I um, wonder if I can show it better on, on this. Uh, maybe I can just go through a little bit of the um, uh, assembly guide. Uh, this is the wrong one. So this is the main uh, optics bracket. Um, these are the dis display trays that fit in under here um, and that carry the displays. They're the displays and you slot them into this wedge like this. And um, yeah, you can see that they're there. This is without the, the lens on the front, the polycarbonate lens. The lens then goes on top of that um, and then you look out through the lens as the screens reflect light onto the onto the combiner. Yeah, so there's no LEDs inside the polycarbonate or anything like that. It's just projected onto it. Thank you for that answer. Um, if you guys have any other questions, please feel free to ask. We have a couple more minutes. So um, Sam, I have a question that maybe the audience might be wondering if someone were to be interested with creating these audio visual experiences, where would you recommend they get started? Like a good starting point, because in a lot of projects, it's hard to get started, but 
once you get going, you can finally like develop your stuff and grow and experience new things. Yeah, so what that, would you recommend? Definitely, that definitely resonates with me. Um, for for I'll just say a, a small um, bit about something that I think is quite important before you get to the point of um, snowballing into those projects, and it's that. Um, you have a way to document and archive what you're doing because it's really important when you look back on what you've done to have like an archive of photos, videos, screenshots, notes that you took about how the project was then and how it was at the next step and the next step. And that's a really, really important thing, I think. So on my website, um, I, I've done this for the North Star thing. Uh, and the project that I'm working on. And one of the most important things that I've done so far is to hack a Raspberry Pi onto the front of it and put a camera. I think you can just about see the camera if I hold it like this. Um, sorry, that is the camera that you're looking through on the, um, on the Zoom stream when I did the demo. And that camera alone has allowed me to make videos about my uh, practice, my audiovisual experiences in Unity. Um, I even archived the making of the camera on my website. So I, I, I wrote a section here about how I made the camera, what it allows me to do in OBS, which is my compositing thing. I can record all of these pictures and videos together. Um, and that means that I can make these videos like um, painting in AR and stuff like that and moving stuff about. And I can just generally just make videos about the experience of using the project. And I think that's a really important part of how to get involved with these projects. Um, but where to start with audio visual, um, specifically with AR, I think that if you're in a like from a pro programming background, if you're from a CS background, like a human computer interaction background, you might feel more comfortable looking at documentation. Um, um, so for audio, there's a great um, uh, audio in AR. There's the documentation that Mixed Reality Toolkit gives you. Um, which for Project North Star uh, you, you're using in Unity, uh, it's where the support is. Um, and there's a good deal of stuff on the spatial audio in here. Um, audio and mixed reality, some good ideas for things to do and things not to do, how to spatialize correctly, how to make things work, audio and visual. Um, so that's from a CS background, from a human computer interaction background, from a programming background. Like I don't come through that, I come through making music. So for me, it's slightly different. Uh, for me, I'm inspired by the music that I listen to, which is uh, ambient uh, music, drones, drone music, sorry, not flying drones, as in like drone sounds. Um, types of music that focus on environmental sound or like glitch sound. These are all really interesting to me and they kind of spark that interest in oh, what would this feel like? What would this sound feel like? What would this, uh, what would the aesthetic of this be? And then I just kind of pick at that idea and, 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 and note stuff down about it, which is where the documenting and archiving gets really important because you kind of need a, like a book or a, a note, a notepad of, 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 of how you feel and what you're feeling about your project as time goes on. And looking back makes you think, oh, wow, I had that idea, but I haven't followed through on it yet. So maybe I should focus on that this week. Um, yeah. So I, I guess maybe that answers your question. Maybe it doesn't. Um, yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, if the audience has any more questions, feel free to ask. We have like two, three more minutes.
someone said thank you um thank you thank you for your question okay i think that will be all um thank you so much sam for spending your time with us today demoing and showing your background your experiences and telling us how to get started in this field which is absolutely incredibly fascinating no problem thank you so much for having me um, of course Hope Day seems like an amazing initiative um like well done and uh like power to you for doing this um, thank you and thank you for hosting me of course thank you for coming have a great day everyone thanks everyone bye